Uh, we're going to talk a bit about orthobiologics uh, in shoulder sports medicine. So these are just the clinical results of what we're seeing in biologics and shoulder sports medicine today and kind of the ideas of where we're going with it as well. So we're going to start with PRP. Now, you've heard a lot about it already. You've heard Gus, Lisa, um, and Werner, Andres talk about this quite a bit today. And you already know that the basic definition of PRP is very basically just the volume of plasma fraction of autologous blood that has a plate of concentration above baseline. That's all there is to it. But PRP has really taken a hit, as you've heard, uh, in the past two days, over, since 2010 and 2011. But you have to understand why. A lot of these studies, as you've heard, have been underpowered. They're using different systems. They're not done in perhaps, perhaps the proper manner, as well as with the proper diagnosis in the proper way. So the literature, however, has been coming out recently in 2011, 2012, showing that it is effective. There have been level one studies. So we do know that it is treatment effective in a way. It is effective in lateral chondylitis, and it is effective in rotator cuff repairs. We actually have these level one studies now available. We also know that there's clinical outcome studies looking at plasma versus Buffy code systems, and that plasma-based systems are, in fact, giving us better early results with fewer complications. We also know that it produces less inflammation, that the plasmas don't, and that's related to the white blood cells that Lisa Forti and Brian Cole has shown us. Plasma-based systems has improved results over HA and OA. So we do know that it has been effective in certain situations. And the key, which you've been hearing over and over today, is the fact that it depends on how you do it, how you use it, and what system you use. Now, my experience over the past six years is we've done over 2,000 PRP injections, surgically and non-surgically, over the past since 2007, using various systems. Now, we've looked at PRP versus cortisone injections for the non-surgical treatment of shoulder pain. We found that with over a three-year period using 485 patients with injections of cortisone versus PRP under ultrasound guidance, so we knew exactly where we were putting it, we were able to evaluate the differences between these two. And as you can see on this video, we are able to see exactly where we want to go. So if we want to be in the subacromial space, if we want to be in the cortisone, if we want to, uh, the, the calcium uh, defect, if we want to be within the partial tear, we can be exactly where we want to be. And I think this is really critical in any of the studies that you look at, making sure that they do what they say they're doing. So if they say they're going to do an injection to the UCL or rotator cuff or Achilles, did they get there? Did they go paratendon, intratendon? Where did they go and could they visualize it? So with our patients, we found that with pain scores and ASES scores, we did have a significant difference between three and six months with P less than 0.05, showing that PRP was more effective than cortisone. We also found that with specific diagnoses, there was quite a difference. For example, with posta lesions, with partial articular-sided supraspinatus tendon avulsions, we found that, in fact, cortisone was not effective at all. And in fact, these patients usually went on to surgery. However, when using PRP into the exact lesion under ultrasound guidance, we were able to significantly improve outcomes and prevent these patients from going on to surgery. So we found that with things like calcific tendinitis, tendinopathies, and partial tears, we could be very effective. When they were high-grade partial tears, it tended not to work. They needed surgery. And that brought on the next point. Now, Lisa and Forty has showed us very clearly that there is an anti-pain and anti-inflammatory effect with PRP. But we also know that when you have dealing with a full thickness tear, like a rotator cuff, a slap lesion, a meniscal tear, PRP is not going to heal that tear. That needs surgery. But doing the injections can reduce the pain and inflammation associated with that lesion, at least temporarily. And that's why we saw no difference, essentially, between PRP and cortisone. So our conclusion was that PRP was more effective than cortisone for relief of shoulder pain, but with less risk. PRP is more effective than cortisone in certain types of pathologies, like postal lesions or tendinopathies, and give no statistical difference when you're dealing with an inflammatory process or any kind of actual mechanical tear. So literature does show us that the different systems also matter. So not just the pathology, but the system itself that you use does matter. We have seen through numerous studies that white cell concentration increases destructive proteins and can inhibit healing. We've also seen that plasma-based systems are more beneficial for OA applications and that more plates, platelets per Gus Mazaka does not give us a better response. Therefore, we looked at the clinical application, not just the basic science. We looked at seeing how increased concentration of white cells, in fact, can weaken 
rotator cuff tendons when used for posture repairs. So we looked at a case control study using three different groups. One group with posture repairs with no PRP, a second group with posture repairs with PRP with concentrated white cells, and a third group with posture repairs with PRP with reduced white cells. And what we found was, at first, there was no difference between the ASCS and visual analog scale scores. However, the mode of failure was very different. In group one, where we had no PRP, we found that the failure rate was based on non-healing of the lesion. So if you went back in arthroscopically, the tear didn't heal. The tear was still there. However, in group two, all the patients healed, but we found in about 14% cut through by the tendon, whereas this never showed up in any of the patients before. And in group three, where we had reduced white cells, we actually had healing, but we found no cut through, indicating that PRP does aid and help with posture repairs, but however, it does with concentrated white cells create a zone of weakness. And we do believe that based on Lisa Forte's work, the neutrophils are the culprit. Now, that's essentially what we were looking at in terms of clinical outcomes, but we also looked at how PRP affects our surgery as, as well. We know that with our surgical outcomes and our surgical techniques, we do good. We do very good, but we don't do perfect. We don't have outstanding. We still have failures. So we need to somehow improve our outcomes because we're getting to the terminal velocity of optimal anchors and optimal sutures. So at this point, we looked at slap repairs with PRPs. We found in the case control study using 178 patients of slap repair with or without PRP that we did have to put the PRP into the repair. You can't just layer it on top, you can't just squirt it in the joint, you've got to place it where it has to go. We know, as Peter Millett told us earlier today, that tendon heals from bone. The tendon doesn't heal into the bone, the bone brings stem cells up into the actual repair and causes healing to occur. Therefore, you want the stimulus, the alpha granules from the platelets, to be released on location, in vivo, on site. You can't preactivate the PRP. You can't just create a clot and put it in there. You want those alpha granules to be released on location, in site, in the repair. So therefore, placing that PRP in the repair first and then repairing it down is going to be critical. We found that there was statistical significance in pain scores from three months on, ASCS scores from one month on, time to discharge, return to work, and failure rate from 10 to 0.7%. So we said that PRP did not accelerate healing we said that PRP ensured that the healing process was initiated properly where placed. So we then extended it to pasta bridge. Now this was an easy percutaneous technique that we've developed that combines horizontal mattress and bridging style repair, but no arthroscopic knot tying. And again, this is percutaneous. So what we do is we place two 2.4 biocomposite suture tack anchors in a percutaneous manner through the cuff into the medial row. After that, we go ahead and place our PRP into the repair, and you'll see, using thrombin, we get instant clotting on location. You can see that it doesn't flow away and fly away, and this is still under an aqueous environment. After we do our repair, and we see everything's tied down, we can go back and take a look. And what we find when we go take a look inside, directly after that repair done, we see that that post repair has now been repaired back down. It's no longer there. But you'll see to the right, there's a small amount of tissue that is actually from your PRP. So we know that it helps create a clot immediately on location in situ where you want it. Now that's PRP. Now that's kind of where we are and where we've been going. But the next step is biocartilage, ECM. This is actually a micronized cartilage ECM and a potential augment for microfracture. Basically it's gonna allow bone marrow stem cells to attach and grow. Initial studies have shown that actually adult stem cells seeded onto lifelike cartilage scaffolding can create new cartilage which resembles articular hyaline cartilage. More studies have been showing hyaline-like cartilage in support of this in vivo studies. Now the US options are limited. We can only do ACI or de novo type procedures, but they all must be done open, sometimes require two procedures, and be very expensive. So with the new advent of this biocartilage, which is less expensive and can be done arthroscopically, it gives us a new option. Here, for example, is a cartilage lesion in the hemorrhoid head. This has been done in talus, in the ankle. It's been done in knees as well. What we do is we take down that cartilage layer and the calcific layer, create a margin for the cartilage. We then have to turn the water off. And we have to do this in a non-aqueous environment. 
we have to layer in our biocartilage, fill in the defect, and at that point, put in a fibrin coating layer. So the fibrin goes in, and it'll be layered on to help seal the area. We want to seal away the synovial fluid. We know synovial fluid gives us problems with healing. It does inhibit healing. Therefore, by isolating the area away from the synovial fluid, we have a better chance for the stem cells to migrate and use that as a scaffold for healing. Now, what's next after that? Flexi flexigraph, DBM sponge. What we found is that with partially demineralized cancellous sponges, we have even more options. Rodeo Nanoski has shown us that regarding tendon and bone healing, that there's an increase in strength of the interface that's proportional to the amount of osseous ingrowth. And it also, we've seen that improving the osseoconductive and inductive environment does improve bone tendon healing. And Sundar has shown us that if you use DBM and tendon repair, that you see a mineralized fibrocartilage at 12 weeks that shows a more mature and organized tendon bone interface much faster, almost by 50% over just standard repair. So we took this into the, into the surgery, and we took it into our use with patients. And we found, for example, with pasta bridges, we can go ahead and take this DBM sponge and incorporate it into our repair quite easily arthroscopically. So what we'll do is, as we're placing our anchor, we'll actually go ahead and grab that sponge and place, place the anchor directly through the sponge, both from our anterior and our posterior anchor. What this allows us to do is create fixation of that sponge into our defect and into our repair. Then, taking our PRP, it allows intercalation of that PRP as a scaffolding to be holding that plot into place. You can see the final outcome outside after we've done our double pulley and, and swin vented swivel lock. We can then go ahead with a biter and take away any excess uh, sponge away from the actual repair so there's not too much into the joint. But even better, we can take this into full thickness repairs. And as Peter showed you earlier, with speed bridge and suture bridge, we can also go ahead and place our anchors into that tuberosity, into our medial row. Once our anchors are into place, and of course suture bridge is easier because this way with, with speed bridge, the actual larger fiber tapes can actually cause some tearing of this sponge, but the sutures are ideal. And therefore, after going ahead and tying in our, our little tiny sponge, we can pass our sutures. What this will allow us to do is to place the sponge into the interface between the bone and the tendon. And this way, once this is done, we, we can tie in both the anterior and the posterior sutures and place our sponge directly into our repair. Here, as we pull the sutures that have already been placed, you'll see at first it looks a bit like a rat's nest, but as you pull, it all just falls right into place. And you can see that sponge falling perfectly between the bone and the tendon interface. After that's done, it's basic. You basically much pass the rest of your sutures, tie it down, and it's standard suture bridge technique. Once this is all tied in place, place your lateral vented swivel lock. After that, place your PRP into the intercalated area for the sponge, and you're done. Now, this is something that's just been done in the past month or two that we've actually been doing this. We've only done about 10 cases of this on each one. So at this point, we have no clinical data to show you for the, for the biocartilage or for the flexigraft, but see you in Arthur Paris, and hopefully at that point, we'll have some excellent data to show you. If you want to see these videos again, you can go onto my website, and I'll be happy to show you there as well. Thank you very much.